Welcome. Uh, our topic this morning, as you well know, is uh, how does international law limit the war on terrorism? Uh, it's a topic that is of uh, considerable interest to our court. Um, we've had many, many cases. In fact, there are 310 habeas uh, cases pending in the D.C. Circuit at one level or another uh, coming from Guantanamo Bay. And uh, a case that I sat on along with Judge Roberts and Judge, then Judge Roberts and Judge Williams is pending in the Supreme Court involving uh, Osama bin Laden's personal driver. Um, there's an allegation he was more than that. The case is Hamdan uh, versus uh, Rumsfeld. And that case is scheduled for argument in the Supreme Court on, I believe, March 29th. Uh, there's some question about uh, whether uh, there's a jur well, there's a jurisdictional question, and there's also a jurisdictional question in cases that are pending in our court that are going to be re-argued on the jurisdictional point uh, toward the end of March as well. Uh, you, you may well know, uh, but just in case you don't, that Congress um, passed a detainee act that amended the habeas corpus jurisdiction of the district courts uh, in December. And the act deprived the district courts of jurisdiction over habeas cases coming from Guantanamo Bay uh, detainees and invested exclusive jurisdiction in our court, but then limited it. So this, this entire issue uh, of the effect of international law is one that's been uh, before us uh, a number of times, first in Al Oda, uh, which is now back. Uh, after the Supreme Court decision, then in Hamdan, and then in the cases that we heard in December, which are going to be argued on jurisdictional questions. And because of that, I'm uh, very much constrained in, uh, in talking. We have an ethical rule that prohibits judges from commenting on the merits of pending cases um, in your own court or, in fact, in anybody else's uh, court. So I'm not going to talk about that, uh, talk about the merits at all, uh, to your great relief, I'm sure. <laughs> But our panelists will. Um, so, and our first panelist is John Yu. John Yu uh, has been in the Washington Post every day for about a month now. Uh, <laughs> there was a long article last, was it Thursday or Wednesday? And, an, and another article announcing that you're going to take a sabbatical and go to, uh, this is big news in Washington. John Yu's taking a sabbatical, much to the relief of a great number of people, I'm sure. <laughs> You're going to Italy, John? John's a professor at the University of California, Bolt Hall, Berkeley. Uh, he graduated summa cum laude from uh, Harvard uh, as a JD uh, from Yale. And matter of fact, all three of our panelists here have a JD from Yale, and all three of them were simultaneously students of the, the, the great professor down the end, which is uh, uh, quite a coincidence. Uh, John was article editors, uh, editor of the Yale Law Journal and then clerk for Judge Silberman as did Cy. Uh, we were next door neighbors. Our chambers were uh, right uh, abutted one another. And then clerk for uh, Justice Thomas, taught uh, not only at uh, Berkeley, but the University of Chicago and the University of Amsterdam, was general counsel to the Senate, and then uh, was legal counsel at the Department of Assist Deputy, Assist Deputy was a deputy assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel from 2001 to 2003, during which uh, there was a great uh, turmoil, as you know, uh, after 9-11. Um, John's written books, uh, law review articles. He won the Bator Award from the Federalist Society for Outstanding uh, Legal Scholarship. And uh, each panel member will get the usual 15 minutes, and then we'll have a round of rebuttal, and uh, then we'll take questions. John? Uh, Judge Randolph, thanks for that uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, well, I guess I'm the morning coffee. Um, I asked the uh, organizers last night why they scheduled uh, our panel for 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Uh, the nice ones said, well, we think people will get up early to come to your panel. Uh, my experience has been that protesters don't wake up early in the morning. Um, but I'd like to think it's actually to our advantage because, well, uh, uh, 1,200 Federalist Society students, as a, 
certainly a uh, friendly audience. 1,200 Federal Society students with hangovers is an extremely pliant uh, audience. <laughs> and it is true, uh, as uh, the judge said, that all of us on the panel, oh, at least the three of us on the panel, were all students of Aquila Mars all at the same time. And so uh, I'm a little, um, a little deterred as, at being as um, aggressive as uh, Jeremy Rabke, my friend, was last night um, in the face of someone who's actually going to pass and review on what I said, who I actually uh, respect and admire, uh, Akhil Amar. Um, but it is a sign, I guess, of uh, Yale Law School's influence that all three of us were students at the same time. It actually disturbs me a little bit, but I actually think it's a much safer place for Yale Law School graduates to be, which is on panels and not in the government. Um, <laughs> Last thing I'll just say is uh, it's great, also let me say it's great to be here at um, this assembly. When I was a second year student, I helped uh, work on the National Student Symposium at Yale, which was held at Yale, I think, in 1991. Um, and we thought we had a great turnout. We had 200 people. And so it's really incredible to me to see a, this uh, large audience. It's very uh, um, heartwarming. It's also, I think, great for Columbia to have all these uh, conservative law professors and their opponents come. Uh, here, it's probably the greatest assemblage of conservative thinking at Columbia since before John Manning left for Harvard. <laughs> so finally, um, let me actually get to the topic at hand. <laughs> um, and I'll try to be very uh, brief. Uh, but this question of international law and does it constrain the United States and the war on terrorism, uh, obviously there are three very important and discrete subjects that have come up. Uh, on that uh, issue, you know, are the members of Al-Qaeda prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions? Can the United States detain people captured in the war on terrorism at Guantanamo Bay? And then can the United States, or could it once have, interrogated uh, those people captured in the war on terrorism in ways that were coercive, short of torture, but might have constituted cruel and humane and degrading treatment? And I think, uh, you know, my three points I'd like to make today are just to ask, one, um, is international law really law that ought to constrain the actions of the executive branch and the Congress? Uh, two, um, how can that international law actually become real federal law that would be enforceable in the United States? And then three, and this is, I think, more, uh, I think a question that only uh, once uh, a little bit discussed last night, but I think is the most important one is, would it be best for the United States or the world for the United States to have to follow international law in the war on terrorism. So I first, uh, you know, is international law really law, law was really the subject of last night's panel. And I think, you know, I don't think there was a lot of debate over some of these points. You know, is international law made in a democratic fashion? Uh, you know, I think most everybody in the panel thought no. Um, is it made by a legitimate or accountable legislature akin to the one we have in the United States? Again, I think most of the panelists yesterday would have said no. And is it enforceable by a supranational government? Again, I think most people would have said no. I think the bigger question is whether countries ought to follow voluntarily international law and in that way uh, enforce it. But it doesn't appear to be law in the way that we've been taught uh, laws made or enforced uh, in domestic legal systems. And what I would like to uh, just propose, uh, the point I don't think was made so much is that um, adherence to international law today is really more about political self-interest of nations, not the content of the rules, but whether those rules ought to be obeyed at all. And if we understand it in that way, it ought to give us pause about thinking, should international, the modern form of international law, be, uh, have binding effect on the United States and the war on terrorism? So I think Europe, understandably, wants to bind the United States into a system of international institutions of inter and international law because it is a, a set of the weaker powers right now. The United States, as was being said yesterday, was the global hegemon in the international system. Uh, well, I like John McGinnis very much. He did not create this phrase. Um, this was a phrase created by Thucydides, actually, and is one that's co consistently talked about today by international relations scholars. And many of them argue not about whether the United States is the most powerful country in the world, but just how powerful is it? Is it more powerful than any other country in the world ever has been? And so in that kind of context, it makes a great deal of sense, it seems to me, for uh, Europe to want to try to affect the policies of the United States by making claims and appeals to uh, 
international law, just the way in the 18th century our framers uh, in the United States, the United States being the weaker country, then used international arguments to try to constrain the British during the Napoleonic Wars. And we also say this is something that the Europeans have not exactly been consistent about since the end of World War II. Right? Does anyone remember the Suez attacks by Great Britain? Great Britain for Jeremy raised his hand. Yes, he does. <laughs> he was there. <laughs> The, the, you know, the British and French interventions in the Suez in the 1950s, you know, didn't hear any claims that, uh, by British and France that, they were, uh, that this was consistent with the UN Charter. Or most recently, Kosovo. I thought that was uh, you know, a war that was going to be mentioned inevitably last night in response to some of the questions, but were not. The Kosovo War was clearly illegal under the UN Charter. Right? There's no, the United States didn't even claim self-defense. And usually we claim self-defense every time we go to war with somebody. Um, and the Europeans certainly didn't claim self-defense, too, and the UN Security Council never approved the conflict. So I think the important thing is to think of international law as a species of international politics, one where countries are using, are promoting their self-interest in order to affect the policies of other countries, and one way uh, that the Europeans who are not putting their resources into military force, and certainly not using military force abroad in any great way, are trying to constrain of the United States and its activities. Another thing I'll say about the Europeans that being in their self-interest, that makes a lot, a great deal of sense is in the war on terrorism in particular, they have very different interests than ours. They do have an interest in stopping terrorism, but they are constrained by a high level of Muslim populations in their own countries whom they don't want to upset or turn against them. And so it's more difficult for them, I think, to treat terrorism as a matter for war. And it's much more comfortable for them, for their own domestic affairs, to treat terrorism as a matter for crime. But given all that, does it make sense then to consider international law as a species of law that has to be directly enforced in US courts or in, within the United States under the President's Take Care Clause? I do want to say that it doesn't seem to me that <clears throat> um, international law could never be uh, adopted and enforced in that way, but that the Constitution sets out very clear procedures as to how that's done. Right? The international law is not of its own force uh, automatically federal law. It's not mentioned in the Supremacy Clause. Right? The Supremacy Clause is Constitution, federal laws, and treaties. It doesn't mention international law that comes about aside from treaties. And as some uh, mentioned last, I think as Judge Jacobs mentioned last night in describing the law of the Second Circuit, the Supreme Court and other courts have found that international law has to go through some kind of process of political enactment in order to become binding law in the United States. It has to come about through treaties, statutes passed by Congress, or through uh, unilateral executive branch order. And I think that's important because what that shows is that international law and whether uh, to comply with it and how to comply with it, at least under our Constitution, is fundamentally a policy decision that the elected branches make and they have to weigh those questions vis-a-vis -vis other ones. And even, I think, it's important to go beyond that and say even after the political branches have incorporated international law, the Constitution still creates a system, a politically accountable system, as to how that law is to be interpreted and enforced, primarily through the President. So take the Geneva Convention question, right? The Geneva Convention question is whether the Geneva Conventions applied to the war on terrorism, and particularly whether members of Al-Qaeda had the legal status of prisoners of war. Now, according to the uh, executive branch, I think the executive branch, politically accountable as it is, made the decision that the war on terrorism was not covered by the Geneva Conventions and Al-Qaeda was not uh, entitled to the legal status of prisoners of war because Al-Qaeda is not a nation state and never signed the Geneva Conventions. And so could not be legally, um, cannot be legally entitled to the benefits of a treaty which not only did not sign but clearly chooses not to follow in its own conduct. And we had an election in 2004. Uh, President, Ke I'm sorry, Senator Kerry <laughs> could have campaigned against President Bush on this point and said, look, I think the United States has made mistakes in the war on terrorism, and if I'm elected, right, I will interpret the Geneva Conventions differently. And instead, I think if you recall, Senator Kerry tried, in fact, to outflank President Bush to the right on terrorism. Right? If you remember some of the debates, he must have said, kill, kill, capture, capture, terrorists, you know, like a kid who'd learned a new word in school. <laughs> but I also think this means that under our system, politically accountable system, presidents also can at times violate international law if they choose to do so. 
And this is not some great innovation that's been created by this Bush, the, the Bush administration. Um, just in Cold War history, you think of President Truman deciding to drop nuclear weapons on Japan, which many people in international law today think was a violation of humanitarian law at the time. You think of President Reagan uh, supplying arms to the Contras and attacking Nicaragua, which was held by the International Court of Justice to be a violation of international law. You think of President Clinton deciding to bomb Kosovo in violation of the UN Charter. And then we have uh, today people arguing about whether President Bush violated international law in deciding to invade Iraq. But I think all those go to show, though, that as a matter of our practice, presidents, at least since the end of World War II, have violated international law when they thought it was in the best interests of the United States. And that under our legal system, that is the way those decisions should be made, and those people are politically accountable. I only have a few minutes left, left so let me close with um, asking or addressing the question, would it be best for the United States to follow international law in the war on terrorism? And I think some of the arguments we heard uh, yesterday were an argument in favor of following law just because it's law and following international law just because international law is law, regardless of the content of it. And I think one thing that that ignores, or one thing that that assumes, sorry, one thing that that assumes is that war that we have today is just like war in the past. And the legal norms that were developed for a war between nation states can be immediately applied in a war against terrorism. And I think the question is, is that really the case? Right? Even if we were to approach international law as law, it is, as people said on last night, more like a common law legal system. And isn't it the job of us as common law international lawyers, as it were, to figure out how those old norms should apply to a new circumstance? And I think the new circumstances we face today justify a different, or a different application of the rules. Think about the kind of enemy we're facing today. It's not a nation state. It doesn't have cities or population or territory. The United States is not going to win by producing more tanks and raising large armies and fielding them against another nation. Instead, we are fighting an army, against, uh, an army of similarly minded religious extremists who bear no allegiance to any country and operate in a network. And their primary means of operation is attacking purely civilian targets in violation of the core <coughs> notions of the laws of war. And the question I was asked is, is it so obvious and clear that international law of the kind formed for the kinds of wars we saw in World War II really applicable so obviously and quickly to this new kind of conflict? Or should we not instead be honest, and I think this is the point of the panel, not be honest and say what we are really doing is trying to figure out how those rules ought to best be shaped to this new kind of circumstance, unfortunately very dangerous circumstance. And the only thing I would say in closing is that that is a job, it seems to me, of our political branches, taking into account the policy costs and benefits of their decisions in any of these areas, whether to follow international law or not, and not to sort of blindly accept even the opinion of a great many of other nations who have their own interests at heart. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Catherine Powell, who uh, teaches at Fordham Law School, has been since 2002, specializing in human rights and uh, comparative constitutional law, civil procedure. As you know, she received her JD from Yale. Um, uh, I heard last year at Yale, she was a Ford Fellow at uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, she also received her BA from Yale and her master's from Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of uh, Public and International Affairs. She clerked for Leonard, uh, or Judge Leonard Sand, the Southern District of New York, was assistant counsel for what we used to call the Inc. Fund, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Inc., um, and has many publications. She started here at Columbia, the Human Rights Institute, was a founding executive director for a number of years. Uh, Thanks a lot, Judge Randolph. Um, well, I met Judge Kaczynski in the lobby of the hotel last night at 2 a.m. And um, <laughs> after a um, brief exchange of words, he quickly sized me up and identified me as a stealth American Constitution Society member. <laughs> Let me just clarify for the record, I am not a card-carrying member of the ACS, nor am I a card-carrying member of the Federal Society. But I am quite impressed with the job that 
you've done in putting this program together today. So I want to thank the organizers. I also want to start by putting my remarks in the context of the themes of the conference. As you know, since September 11th, we've had several debates about the relationship between internationalism and constitutionalism. Two of these controversies, while interrelated, diverge in ways that are striking. On the one hand, we've had the debate about the democratic legitimacy of courts using international and foreign law in the interpretation of the Constitution, a topic to be addressed on a panel later today. But we've seen how this has played out in the Supreme Court in Roper versus Simmons, the juvenile death penalty case, Lawrence v. Texas, the anti-sodomy case, uh, to name but two, where some of the justices have used international and foreign law in interpreting the Constitution, while critics of this practice have claimed that it lacks democratic legitimacy. On the other hand, we've had a debate about whether or not international law constrains the president in the war, in his, his war on terrorism. This controversy seems strangely disconnected from the debate about the democratic legitimacy of using international law and in interpreting the Constitution. And I say strangely disconnected because in the context of the war on terrorism, the claim made by critics of applying international law isn't that international law is democratically illegitimate, Rather, the claim is that following international law would allow for too much democracy in the sense that ratified treaties and treaties implemented by Congress into statutes would encroach on the president's power to wage war as commander in chief. I'm focusing today in particular on the issue of torture in my case study because I'm working on a paper related to the topic. But I think that at least some of the conclusions I draw could be applied to other methods used in the war on terrorism, like the use of indefinite detention without charges or the use of military tribunals to try terrorism suspects. When we consider treaties that prohibit torture, as well as cruel, inhumane, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment, we can usefully consider the Convention Against Torture and the Geneva Conventions. These treaties have been democratically incorporated, not only by ratification of the President with the advice and consent of two-thirds of the Senate, but also through implementing legislation by Congress, at least parts of them, through the Federal Torture Statute and the War Crimes Act. Significantly, the Federal Torture Statute implements our obligations under the Torture Convention by playing a statutory gap-filling function of sorts. So torture that occurred within the United States was already a crime in the U.S. when we ratified the Convention, but the uh, Federal Torture Act extends this prohibition to torture that occurs outside the United States, so to places like Guantanamo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. The War Crimes Act implements our obligations under the Geneva Conventions. Perhaps most relevant for, uh, for the issue of torture is that the War Crimes Act defines war crimes as including Common Article 3. So this is the article common to all four Geneva Conventions uh, that provides minimum baseline protections available even to those detainees who don't qualify for formal POW status, prisoner of war status. These minimum protections include, among other things, uh, torture, the prohibition against torture, and outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment. Okay, so this gets a bit technical, but my basic point is that the prohibition against torture is reflected in both international law and domestic law and that the international standard is democratically incorporated into domestic law by Congress through legislation. Indeed, there's fairly wide consensus that international law operates at its best when there's this kind of convergence between international and domestic law. So on the one hand, we have Jerry Newman, who points out that typically when a norm is expressed in positive law at both the international and domestic levels, such as the prohibition against torture, it satisfy what he, what he, satisfies what he calls dual positivization, that, uh, and that this kind of convergence between the international and the domestic is desirable. This view is echoed by other scholars that we might refer to as internationalists, Lou Hinken and Harold Coe, who also view this kind of convergence as uh, valuable, but who also believe it's not necessary for international law to be binding federal law. On the other hand, we have our colleague John Yu and other scholars like Kurt Bradley, who I know is here today, and Jack Goldsmith, who um, have questioned the legitimacy of customary international law and even ratified treaties as full-fledged federal law, uh, claiming that these sources of international law are not self-executing or otherwise not, uh, do not fully qualify as federal law, unless and until they're implemented by Congress by federal, through federal statutes, that is, unless and until they're incorporated in a more deeply democratic way than is available through mere ratification alone. 
In my own work, in a, a piece I published a few years ago, Dialogic Federalism, I too have called for uh, deeper modes of democratic deliberation to incorporate international law. And in this sense, I gesture to you and, and Bradley and Goldsmith. At the same time, I fundamentally agree with Hinken, Newman, and, uh, and co that ratified treaties and, and customary international law are binding federal law, even in the absence of implementing legislation. And we can pick this up in discussion in greater detail. Again, my main point here is that while there's disagreement over whether or not international law is full-fledged federal law, there seems to be a fairly wide consensus that when international law and domestic law converge, that is when it's implemented uh, by Congress in, uh, through statutes, that um, this is desirable. It's therefore curious that on the one hand, in the absence of implementing legislation, critics of applying international law to interpret the Constitution call for exactly this kind of democratic deliberation in interpreting the Constitution. While on the other hand, critics of applying international law in the context of the war on terrorism balk at enforcement of implementing legislation as an impermissible encroachment on the President's power to wage war as commander in chief. Okay, so now we could say, well, actually, it's not so curious. After all, it's war, stupid. War justifies, in fact, calls for less democratic deliberation. We need a single decision maker, and that would be the president. We're all familiar with the pitfalls of collective action. In my view, there are at least three potential responses to this. Okay, so one response is that since the Constitution divides power over foreign affairs, it gives Congress substantial responsibility, including a wide array of war power. So power, Congress has the power to provide for the common defense, raise and regulate the military, define uh, uh, offenses against the law of nations, to regulate international commerce, to declare war, to issue uh, marks, letters of mark and reprisal, and significantly, the power to make rules concerning capture on land and water. While the commander-in-chief power recognizes the need for the president to exercise unified control over the armed forces, particularly with regard to battlefield operations, uh, the power to regulate the treatment of wartime detainees is a power shared by the legislative and executive branches, including in, according to the text of the Constitution. So the problem for those who believe in a strong executive in wartime and are cynical about the use of international law and co congressional role in incorporating international law constraints on, for example, the treatment of detainees, is that the framers held precisely the opposite views. They were intensely wary of executive power, particularly in light of their experience with the British monarch. They wanted to place more, not fewer, constraints on the decision to go to war. Furthermore, as leaders of a new and vulnerable nation, they were eager to ensure that mutual obligations they had negotiated uh, with other countries would be honored and enforced. There's a second type of response to those who say that less democratic deliberation and uh, participation by Congress in wartime, argue for less participation by Congress in wartime, and for more uh, flexibility for the president to violate international law. And here I use the word violate uh, as opposed to terminate uh, treaty obligations or supersede customary international law because it's not clear to me that uh, the president has terminated the Torture Convention or Geneva Convention or that um, he's undertaken anything amounting to a superseding uh, executive, uh, controlling executive act in the Pakete Habana sense uh, that would supersede customary international law. After all, the president insists that it's not the policy of the US government to torture. So the second response to critics of international law uh, is that once the United States ratifies a treaty which constrains the president's operational discretion in warfare, that treaty ratification empowers Congress to regulate areas where it not, would not otherwise have the power to regulate, and thereby shifts the constitutional balance between Congress and the President. This is an argument that Derek Jinks and David Sloss make uh, in making a sort of Missouri versus Holland move. So for example, once the US ratifies a treaty that prohibits the bombing of undefended towns, Congress has power to enact legislation establishing liability for violation of this norm under the define and punish clause, which enables Congress to incorporate the law of nations into domestic law. Indeed, this is exactly what Congress has done. Article 25 of the Hague regulations became a part of the US criminal code when Congress enacted the War Crimes Act. Jinx and Slosh make a parallel argument under the necessary and proper clause. A third response, and I'm gonna close on this, uh, is to say, well, yes, it, it 
It may prove tempting to suspend or sidestep ob international obligations citing military necessity. After all, as Justice Holmes said, the Constitution can't be a suicide pact, and we may say neither can international law. But I have to close with a reference to Aaron Barak, the outgoing president of the Israeli Supreme Court. He was my teacher at Yale Law School after I took constitutional law from Akhil Amar. I had a comparative constitutionalism class with Justice Barak and uh, Burke Marshall that they co-taught. And he and his wife, Elika, took me under their wings when I moved to Israel for a year, uh, about 11 months after the September 11th attacks, where my husband, we, uh, at the time, there were uh, bombs going off practically every day on the streets and in the cafes and on buses of Jerusalem, where my husband was based with the United Nations and where I was pregnant with our son, who was born there that year. In his landmark decision prohibiting torture, Justice Barack invoked international standards prohibiting torture and made it clear that it was for the legislature, the Knesset, to determine whether physical means may be used in interrogating terrorism suspects. The pointed debate must occur there, in the legislature, he said. It is there that the required legislation may be passed, provided, of course, that a law infringing upon a suspect's liberty is enacted for a proper purpose, and to the extent no greater than is required. This is the destiny of a democracy, that not all means are acceptable to it, and not all practices employed by its enemies are open before it. Although a democracy must often fight with one hand tied behind its back, it nevertheless has the upper hand. Preserving the rule of law and recognition of an individual's liberty constitutes an important component in its understanding of, of security. At the end of the day, they strengthen its spirit and its strength. Its strength allows it to overcome its difficulties. I thought it was Justice Jackson that, that said the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Maybe right Professor Marvel will know. Uh, <laughs> he's writing it down. Right. Our next speaker is Professor Sai Prakash. He is Herzog Research Professor at the University of San Diego Law School and specializes in constitutional law, administrative law, and securities regulation. He graduated uh, from Stanford undergraduate school, and as you know, the Yale Law School, uh, where he was senior editor of the Yale Law Journal and Olin uh, Fellow. Um, Professor Sai Prakash also clerked for Judge Silberman and Justice Thomas. He's also taught uh, as a visiting professor, I think, at the University of Illinois uh, College of Law and at Boston University Law School. Well, I want to thank all of you for getting up this morning and uh, thank the Federal Society and the Columbia Chapter for inviting me today. Uh, the question of the hour is how does or does the law, does international law limit the war on terrorism? And uh, I want to limit my discussion to uh, so-called customary international law, that is international law that does not take the form of a treaty that the U.S. has entered into and international law that's not incorporated into domestic law through a, a statute passed by Congress. And if we're talking about custom international law, there is this view that uh, Professor Powell expressed that uh, custom international law, even though it isn't uh, solemnized in a treaty or a statute, is part of our domestic law nonetheless. And I, I want to uh, I want to argue against that. But first, I want to say that there's you know two senses in which international law might uh, limit the war on terror. One is a, a political sense, and one is a, a legal sense. And um, in the political sense, whatever our views about international law, whether it has domestic force or not. Uh, I, think, I think I think must admit that uh, international law, what international law permits and what it, pr uh, what it forbids likely does play a, a role in limiting the war on terrorism in the following sense. The executive branch and Congress uh, uh, likely care about international opinion to at least some extent, notwithstanding the critics of the Bush administration. And that being the case, they have to be concerned about how their actions will be construed by other nations, in particular whether their actions are viewed as violations of international law. And they'll likely take that into account in deciding whether to take particular actions. It won't always lead them to take the course of action that uh, our allies would prefer, but uh, I would suspect that uh, occasionally uh, that uh, concerns about violations of international law or supposed violations of customary international law uh, 
will affect what uh, will affect what the president and uh, and uh, Congress might choose to do. John may, might speak to that more than I could because he actually served in the government. He can he can tell us whether or not people really cared about international law. But I I suspect that at least some people did. If if not uh, if not some members on the panel here. Um, well, so there's this legal question, right? Does does customary international law is it actually part of the law of the United States? And uh, I don't I don't think it is. Uh, people tend to make two arguments arising out of the text of the Constitution uh, and claiming that those portions of the Constitution actually incorporate uh, customary international law. And they usually cite the Supremacy Clause and the Take Care Clause. Uh, the notion is that the Supremacy Clause mentions laws, and if customary international law is a law, then uh, it's part of the supreme law of the land. Uh, very straightforward claim. The, the difficulty with it is that the Supremacy Clause isn't referencing uh, customary international law when it talks about laws. The Supremacy Clause actually says that it's making laws which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution part of the supreme law of the land. And there's two senses in which it becomes impossible to incorporate uh, customary international law under the phrase laws, laws which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution. Um, the first point is, and I think, I think uh, uh, Curtis Bradley and my colleague Mike Ramsey have made this point, that the Supremacy Clause refers to laws made in the future, right? If the Supremacy Clause says laws which shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution, it's, it's, a, temporal, it's a temporal link and it's got to be referring to laws that are passed after the Constitution is enacted and not laws uh, that are made beforehand. And obviously, customary international law preceded the Constitution. So it's, it's hard to believe that uh, they were referencing customary international law when they talked about laws which will, shall be made in pursuance of the Constitution. And of course, customary international law isn't made in pursuance of the Constitution in any sense. It's made without respect to the Constitution. People uh, who purport to, to find or discover that law uh, aren't doing so with reference to the Constitution at all. So customary international law really isn't made in pursuance of the Constitution either. Um, the second clause is the, the take care clause, and some people argue that the president has a duty to take care that the customary international law is, is faithfully executed. And uh, it act, there's actually some historical support for this in the sense that uh, uh, Alexander Hamilton cited the take care clause as a reason why President Washington had to enforce the neutrality proclamation, or rather to enforce uh, the United States' neutrality in the, when, when England and France were fighting. So there is some historical support for this uh, post-ratification, uh, but I still don't think there's much to support this claim. The faithful execution clause or the take care clause had its antecedents in state constitutions, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, and Vermont. And in none of those states, uh, am I aware of any evidence that the state executives in those states thought they had a duty to, to enforce customary international law. If you recall from your history that one of the problems with the pre-constitutional period is that the states paid too little attention to international law. In particular, they passed statutes that violated our obligations uh, uh, to England after the peace treaty we signed with them. So if, if states were doing that, it if they were violating treaties, it seems, it seems far-fetched to suppose that these provisions were read as, or were, un were understood by the s states themselves as requiring their governors to faithfully execute customary international law. And you know, when you move away from that period of looking actually at the ratification, I, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that people thought that the take care clause actually applied to customary international law. Um, so what about Hamilton? Hamilton talked about this in the context, as I said earlier, of, of President Washington's neutrality proclamation. And I think Hamilton was just, was just wrong. He, he, was, you know, he was trying to def you know, defend a, a a proclamation by Washington. The proclamation was fine. It was the attempt to actually prosecute people that was problematic because there was no law that they had violated. There was no domestic law that they had violated. And when they tried to prosecute people, they were unsuccessful. And I think the Washington administration came to the con correct conclusion that they needed to have a, a statute passed by Congress uh, in order to actually prosecute people for violating neutrality. And so I think that episode actually uh, it, it could be cited as evidence for the view that customary international law is part of our law, but in fact, in the end, at the end of the day, I think there's a consensus in Congress and, and, and the administration, the Washington administration, that they actually had to pass a statute in order for, uh, in order for there to be law that they could actually enforce. Uh, so they couldn't put people in jail for violating neutrality, and I think more importantly, they couldn't stop people from violating the United States neutrality. It was just the policy of the of the Washington administration to be neutral and that individuals could go, 
and side with one part or the other until, until the actual Neutrality Act was passed by Congress. Um, <clears throat> but you know, even if you don't think the Constitution itself incorporates customary international law, it's still possible that customary international law is part of our law nonetheless. And it's, it seems like an odd statement to make, but uh, given their understandings of uh, co the common law and customary international law, it's actually, there, there were some people back then who thought customary international law was part of our law, <coughs> even if they didn't necessarily tie it to our Constitution. So James Wilson, in his famous lectures on the law, uh, you know, who's the, <coughs> in, he, that he gave in, in Philadelphia, he argued that there were certain aspects of international law that were eternal, that all nations had to follow. Uh, and Vattel before him, the great international law theorist, made the same argument well before the Constitution. So it's possible you could, you could take the view that even if the Constitution itself uh, didn't constitutionalize or didn't incorporate customary international law, that people at the time would have understood the system to have incorporated just because you know, good lawyers at the time thought that customary international law, at least a portion of it, um, was something that all nations had to follow, whether or not they had codified it. I think uh, this, you know, this poses an interesting question. Um, first, did the framers actually have, did the founders actually have this mindset that, did they actually believe that customary international law was part of a law or was Wilson perhaps an outlier? And given what happened, once again, if you look at the Articles of Confederation period, given what happened with respect to treaties and how the states uh, violated them, it seems unlikely that they all had this tremendous loyalty and fealty to, to international law of the type that Wilson might have had. Because if they were ignoring treaties that were actually written, it's, it's you know, written into law and agreed to by the United States with other parties, it just, it's hard to believe that they really thought that custom international law um, ought to be binding on the United States. Um, but let's, let's suppose, for instance, the founders actually did think that America was bound to customary international law. Um, are we going to be bound, are we bound in some sense by these, their extra constitutional commitment to customary international law? And this, this poses an interesting question, right? Because if, if you, once you say it's not part of the Constitution, but you just say it's sort of a, a pre-constitutional commitment that some folks or many folks had at the time, what are we to make of that? And it seems to me that, the, you know, the, the, the founding generation likely believed lots of things that we, uh, not, we, that we don't necessarily believe today. For instance, many of them may have felt to, that they were bound to the Ten Commandments, uh, but I don't see that uh, it follows that we have to be bound by those commandments just because many of them thought they might have to be. And I think the same is true for customary international law. Even if it could be shown that the framers really thought that customary international law was binding, in a sense, on the United States, uh, not having constitutionalized that, I'm not sure why that ought to matter to us. Uh, they have, you know, they probably had all sorts of commitments that they didn't put in the Constitution. And if we're taking the Constitution as law and not all their commitments as part of the law, it really ought not matter. Um, if we do actually uh, take the view that uh, customary international law is binding on the United States, I think some radical propositions actually follow, not all of which uh, people who, uh, who, are fa who favor international law actually sort of own up to. If it sort of truly is eternal, if we're working with their, some of the assumptions of Wilson and Battelle, if customary international law has its eternal component, um, it seems to me that the Constitution arguably must give way when it's inconsistent with customary international law. Wilson and Battelle spoke of it as truly binding every nation. And so if you can argue and if you can show that the Constitution is inconsistent with customary international law, the Constitution itself um, would be not unconstitutional, but uh, I guess illegal in a sense when you compare it against customary international law. Understandably, no one, I, I'm not sure anyone's really, really willing to say this, but I think it follows from the commitment that uh, customary international law is mandatory and eternal. Um, another thing that follows is that the Congress cannot pass statutes that violate customary, customary international law. Uh, very few proponents of uh, customary international law actually say this. A couple do, and I think they should be you know, uh, congratulated for being forthright in their convictions. But I don't really know how it is that um, if you believe that customary international law, you know, is this eternal uh, part of the law, part of our common law, how you can say that Congress could possibly stat pass statutes that are uh, contrary to it. I think if you really believe that customary international law um, is this eternal mandatory law, then Congress shouldn't be able to pass statutes in derogation of it, even if you c Congress can point to a, an Article I, Section 8 grant of authority that seems to grant some uh, congressional power over the over the area. And then finally, the, you know, the, the president cannot take actions in violation of international law. John's talked about that a, a bit and said that presidents have done this quite a bit. 
and I think he's right as an historical matter. Here's where the, you know, here's where people on the other side really do believe that a customer international law has, has, has bite and has control, because here they don't have any problems about saying the president uh, uh, has to follow customer international law, but I think they have to also face up to the fact that uh, the, the Congress has to as well, and that the Constitution itself might be, uh, might be illegal when it, when it conflicts with a customer international law. So to, in conclusion, I want to, you know, I, I want to say that if, you know, if you want customer international law to be part of our domestic law, there's a way to do that. Congress has authority to uh, define the law of nations, and if Congress does that, we're, we're posed with the interesting questions that, that uh, John and, and Professor Powell talked about of whether or not uh, statutes that arguably derogate from the President's Commander-in-Chief authority or his executive power are still the law of the land. But at least then we have, a, we have a statute, right? We have a statute passed by Congress, and we can say what international law is and what it isn't. And I'm, I'm afraid now we don't really have that. Well, thank you so much. In fact, during the debates in Philadelphia, the, the question of international law, the law of nations came up. And, and uh, I can't remember which one of the uh, uh, framers said this, but uh, objected that it was too indefinite. And as a consequence, that is why the clause that Congress has the power to define and punish violations of the law of nations is in the Constitution, because it is so indefinite. And I, I can't resist, uh, Cy, the, the idea that, that customary international law is eternal, it strikes me. It, some of the founders, or some of the people back then, believed that natural law controlled. And, and so maybe a, the, our, we should change our topic. It should be, how does natural law constrain the war on terrorism? <laughs> and the, the problem with that, uh, of course, is uh, I'm reminded of uh, an exchange. There's a wonderful multi-volume set called Campbell's Lives of the Lord Chief Justices of England. And, and there was one very witty Lord Chief Justice, Ellenborough, and he had an attorney arguing before him. And the attorney said, <laughs> In the book of nature, my lords, it is written, and Lord Chief Justice Ellenborough interrupting, would counsel kindly cite the page? <laughs> <laughs> well, our next speaker is, uh, really needs no introduction. Uh, professor Akil Amar is South made uh, professor of law at Yale, and he's been uh, at Yale teaching since 1985 after a clerkship with then uh, Judge Breyer on the First Circuit. His specialties are constitutional law, federal jurisdiction, criminal procedure, American legal history. Um, he's written a number of books, one of which he has with him here, and, uh, and that is a, it's American constitutional law, right? right? Yeah. There are copies out there. You can pick them up. Uh, and, and a number of other books, The Processes of Constitutional Decision Making. Do you, ha you have a book in the works now, don't you? Just out. Oh, just out. Okay. Twenty nine ninety five on Amazon. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sales will go up. <laughs> Professor Moore. It's always such a pleasure to be with you here in the Federalist Society. I left my three kids uh, back home in Woodbridge, Connecticut, this morning, um, and uh, I take. A fierce parental pride in them. Let me tell you, though, they're very much, each one of them, their own people, uh, very independent-minded, and my job is to, to help them become uh, uh, independent-minded adults. I take similarly fierce pride in my students at Yale Law School, um, and, and you've seen how independent-minded they are. They don't always agree amongst themselves, and I take fierce pride uh, in, uh, in uh, their accomplishments. And uh, it's been a marvelous conversation, and I'm just so proud to have been able to, to hear it. Um, and so that's why I'm going to explain to my wife that why I had to be away today while she's holding down the fort with the kids. Um, so I'd like to talk about the American constitutional experience over the last two centuries. What that experience has to tell us about the role of international law and politics in our own constitutional tradition, and what all of that might tell us about where we are today as a nation and a world and where we need to go um, if we're to be truest to 
uh, the best elements of the American constitutional experience. Let me start um, where Jeremy Rabkin ended um, his remarks uh, yesterday with the Declaration of Independence. Uh, this is an independence uh, from the rest of the world, a claim uh, that uh, the 13 United States, um, independent even of each other, save as they choose to organize and coordinate their actions, are free and independent states. Uh, capable of doing the things that free and independent states do, one of which, the most, first of which is levying war. Um, this is a series of democratic allies banding together, and so here's one point. It's a multilateral um, uh, event. Um, you need to do that just for pragmatic reasons, because one state cannot go it alone. They have to go it together, and there are some geostrategic considerations, given that they are neighbors, and neighbors um, have particular interests uh, uh, in uh, uh, each other's conduct. Um, and uh, so that's why we do uh, become independent. Uh, why do we have this declaration? Uh, we do. We have a respect for the opinion of mankind. Uh, it's an enlightenment project. We want to tell other people what our reasons are. We do not have to slavishly follow their practices, and much of the Declaration of Independence is rather, um, would be impossible to understand if you thought we were just following what they did. When Declaration of Independence talks about the inestimable privilege of trial by jury, well, almost none of the world has trial by jury, so we're not following them quite, but we actually care what they think. We want to make our reasons transparent to them. We want to appeal to them to the best elements of the world because we actually think we're right. We are light unto the world um, and because we need them. Um, we will need Dutch money. We will need money from the French. We will need ships from the French. We can't do it. We, we can't in the end do it without money and ships from the French. Now, uh, they are not one of the 13 United States, so we have a democratic alliance among the 13 and a different kind of relationship, actually, with the others. The French do help us. Why? Because they love democracy? Well, no, they don't. They're a monarchy. Um, because they love us? No, the French love the French. Um, so why do they help us? Well, basically because they hate the British. And they're motivated. They want to bring the British down a peg or two. They're motivated by a pol the politics of resentment. And we benefit from this. But they're motivated by the politics of resentment, the French. Imagine that. <laughs> With a tip of the chapeau to les Français, uh, we could say, in fact, uh, um, plus ça change, plus, plus la même chose. Um, but um, we do care about world opinion. We did so at the very beginning. That doesn't mean we slavishly follow them. Uh, but you would not be wise to disregard the rest of the world, especially when you're a very fragile um, uh, power yourself. Now, um, let's talk about the Articles of Confederation. It is, as Jeremy Rabkin told you, a treaty, a, a league, um, uh, whose fundamental purpose is collective security. Um, and even in this collective security arrangement, interestingly enough, there is a concern of the collectivity about the individual democracy of the individual 13 states. There's a rule, for example, that none of these states can adopt titles of nobility, that they all actually have to be republican states. So there is this idea of a, a, an emerging idea of actually a community of democracies, that democracies actually help each other, and we have an interest in preserving democracies around us. We invite other regimes to join us in the Articles of Confederation. France actually has a, excuse me, Canada has an open door in Article 9. They don't um, choose to enter that, um, that, that open door. But um, this is a, 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 um, a suggestion that Internationally, because that's what the Articles of Confederation are, they're an international treaty, uh, there may be an interest in democracies trying to um, have standards of, of democratic maintenance with e um, that each uh, member state needs to abide by. And in the Articles, it's that you can't become an aristocracy or a monarchy. You can't give out a title of nobility, a provision that, of course, remains even in our Constitution. And I move now to that, our founding moment. How is it that we get out of the Articles of Confederation? 
and into the Constitution. My friend Bruce Ackerman says it's flagrantly illegal. He famously says this. Um, and I think that misses a lot about, it misses a lot basically about the nature of international law. Um, because um, the framers actually have a couple of arguments about um, why the Articles of Confederation may be disregarded in certain respects. Now, how are they disregarded, just to bring you up to speed? The Articles of Confederation sa say, these rules can't be changed without the unanimous consent of all 13 of the state legislatures. So Article 7 of the Constitution, the last sentence, picking up on the first sentence, first simple sen 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 sentence is, we the people do, or the United States do ordain and establish this document. The last sentence says, here's how we ordain and establish it. The ratification of the Constitution by uh, the conventions of nine Nine state conventions, not legislatures, shall suffice for the establishment of this constitution, the same words as the preamble, uh, among uh, the states so ratifying. So how do you get from 13 legislatures in the Articles Confederation to nine state conventions in the very founding act? The founding is not just a text. It's a deed. It's a doing, a constituting. Um, we the people do ordain and establish. We actually are doing this thing and, and Bruce Ackerman says well, what we're doing is flagrantly illegal and I think he has a certain conception of international law that's maybe a little too uh, rarefied, maybe closer to Jeremy Waldron's in, in some sense. The framers give two answers to this. The first one is a very blunt realpolitik argument. International law, international law. It's a different kind of law than the violation of a domestic law. And here's the reality. That doesn't mean you can always disregard it, but when your absolute um, uh, existence as a, a, a nation, your, the, your, 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 the, the very existence of the self is threatened, the fundamental law is the law of self-preservation, and the article, if we stick around with the Articles of Federation, we will be devoured. We, we ba barely won the last war. We're going to lose the next one. We don't know whether it's going to be against the British or the French or the Spanish, hated by the Indians. We just don't know. But we're going to lose the next war. So our, our very existence as a, a nation state will basically be destroyed if we uh, continue with this bankrupt regime that really is imbecilic and, and not working. And that's a strong realpolitik argument. And the Federalists do make that. And even Tom Frank conceded, well, at a certain level, if it's about national um, uh, survival, uh, international law does yield. But the framers make a uh, more legalistic argument. It's in the Federalist Papers, and they say, actually, um, Articles of Confederation are a treaty, um, but they've been violated all around. And the law of treaties, of compacts, is when one side violates, the other side, as a matter of self-help remedy, can, in effect, rescind. Um, and, and every state has violated, and so every state um, uh, has a right actually to withdraw from this because it hasn't been honored. It's a breached treaty. Um, uh, and um, that's a lawyerly, legalistic argument. Now, if you really bought the logic of this argument, it would say any state can just go on its own. But that's actually not what Article 7 sa does. It actually says nine will go it alone. We're not going to bind the other four. And so, in fact, when George Washington raises his hand um, and takes that presidential oath of office, there are actually only 11 states that have agreed to be bound. North Carolina hasn't, and Rhode Island hasn't, and they're, able to, they're allowed to go it alone and see what it's like on their own in a nasty world. And they decide it's not so great. Um, but the nine don't bind the, f the four. Um, and, uh, um, but... No one says we're just going to go it alone. Now, there's some pragmatic reasons why that's so. Um, but there's also a certain idea of respect for the fellow democracies, that 9 out of 13 was an important rule under the Articles of Confederation. And we're not going to scrap it unless 9 of us actually think that the system is completely bankrupt. So even then, there is an idea that you saw even in the Declaration of Independence of certain multilateralism among the democracies. Democracies shouldn't, they, we're not bound by necessarily what the, the, the French or the Russians or anyone else tell us what to do, but we especially care about what fellow democracies um, uh, uh, um, want to do. Um, and and um, Now, a couple things about the Constitution. The Supremacy Clause actually uh, talks about the, the status of a certain kind of international law, treaties. Constitution, statutes, treaties, state constitutions, state law, in that order. Constitution is highest law because it's most democratic. 
Statutes are mentioned before treaties because they are more democratic and, in my view, they actually have a higher legal status than treaties because the House of Representatives has been involved. So certain treaties cannot just, and this is, and everyone understands this actually, there are certain things you cannot properly do by a treaty. You cannot raise a tax, spend a dime, you cannot create a federal, com, uh, a federal law of crimes merely by treaty because the House of Representatives has not been involved. You can't um, uh, declare a war or create a standing army. And I would say you can't repeal a pre previous federal statute, which involved the House of Representatives. So the last in time rule needs to be rethought a little bit. There's only one case in all Supreme Court history where a treaty has been allowed to supersede a, a statute. Um, uh, so I actually think that there are three tiers of federal law. There's the Constitution, most democratic. There are statutes which involve the House of Representatives. And then there are treaties. Now, treaties are higher than state law. And treaties can trump state law, pre-existing state law, under the Supremacy Clause. You don't want an individual state sucking the rest of us into a war. Um, but treaties should not lightly be allowed to supersede a pre-existing act of Congress. We can promise that we'll repeal the law, but then the House of Representatives has to be involved. One other thing about the Constitution, it requires that each state have a Republican government. Um, so uh, we care collectively about the democracy of each regime, and why do we do that? Because undemocratic regimes are not just threats to their own people, they're threats to their neighbors. This is, again, the community of democracy's idea, and when we don't take it seriously, as we don't, actually, we allow the, uh, in the antebellum period, we allow the South to become highly unrepublican. Freedom of speech is a crime. The Republican Party is outlawed in the South. It's a capital offense to criticize slavery in the Old South. Abraham Lincoln's party is criminalized in the 1850s more than the Communist Party was criminalized in the 1950s. Abraham Lincoln gets, this is an absolute fact, zero popular votes, not electoral votes, zero popular votes south of Virginia in 1860. That is not a, a Republican society. More people voted against Saddam Hussein than voted against the slaveocracy. And, and we ignored that unrepublicanism at our peril. The South threatened its own people, black people, free, uh, slaves, free blacks, uh, uh, anti-slavery whites, and started to threaten Northerners, and the war came uh, because of this. And um, during that war, we are attentive to international public opinion. Lincoln emancipates the slaves partly because British public opinion is important. The, the opinion of de uh, democratic societies around the world is important. Even if it's not binding international law, a wise chief executive and a wise nation do not make themselves um, uh, um, uh, reviled um, in the rest of the, the free world, we care about their opinions. And it's important to keep the British out of the war um, on the side of the South. And Lincoln understands this. Um, some of our greatest constitutional moments have come because we actually cared about world opinion. I gave you the Emancipation Proclamation. Let me tell you about women's suffrage. There is an internal federalism story. Uh, states first give some women the vote. And the states that give women the vote are in the Rocky Mountain West. Uh, Idaho, Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Why? Because there are no women there. And they want women to come. And actually, they say, come on out. We'll, like, we'll let you vote. I've got uh, in the book uh, the Wyoming um, uh, government saying, ju uh, Wyoming uh, newspaper editorial saying just that. And then they start to compete against each other in very interesting ways. That's the domestic story. And the Federal Society is interested in competition among the states. But there's an international dimension, too. Woodrow Wilson goes to the Senate in person and says, woman suffrage is a war measure. We will need to win the peace as well as the war. We are holding ourselves out as the world's leading democracy. We will not have credibility to do that when other societies around the world, including Germany and Austria, are letting their women vote and we don't let our women vote. We need to win the peace as well as win the war. We need to be sensitive to world opinion and giving our women the vote will electrify the women of the world and that's an important audience that we in America need to understand. Um, Brown versus Board of Education. There's a desegregation imperative, uh, a Cold War imperative, as Mary Dujak and uh, other scholars, uh, Mike Klarman and others have talked about. It is important. Our executive branch tells our Supreme Court that we get rid of Jim Crow because it's making us look bad in the third world and we are fighting a global struggle for the hearts and minds of people in Africa and Asia, brown and black and yellow skinned people around the world and we have to treat our own brown and black and yellow skinned people with a certain respect, otherwise we will lose that Cold War. Um, and so um, that's um, a very important fact about our domestic constitutional understanding that's about our sensitivity to world opinion, even if it's not binding international law. 
DC um, gets, the, gets integrated into the Electoral College in the 22nd Amendment. Why does that happen so late? Well, because there are a lot of black people in DC and for a lot of the 20th century, a lot of senators and representatives weren't gonna do anything for a city that had a lot of black people. And then why does it happen in the 1960s? Because it's part of the same Cold War idea that we, this looks very bad when we have these Bantustans, Indian reservations and, um, and uh, 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 Puerto Rico and um, Hawaii actually and uh, DC that are all sort of not fully integrated in and so Hawaii get, becomes a state and Alaska where there are again lots of um, Native American Aleuts becomes a state and DC is integrated in because we're sensitive to world opinion actually. And this is proposed under a Republican President Eisenhower, a Cold War President and ratified under a Democratic president, uh, Kennedy. So it's not a partisan thing about Republican and Democrat. It's what we all um, believe as Americans, but sometimes respect for the opinion of mankind around the world helps us bring out our better, best selves. Now, what does that mean for today? I've got a minute left to tell you about my theory of the world. Here's what it means. <laughs> It means that we need to move toward multilateral organizations that are based on, and they don't have to be binding necessarily, they could even be organizations where straw polls are taken, but it needs to be a genuine community of democracies around the world. That would be the truest to our American constitutional tradition. The General Assembly is not that, it's a bit of a joke. Um, the Security Council is not that, because there are all these thugs on it. Um, um, the G7, G8, why should it only be the rich nations that count? Um, NATO is not that, that's way too Eurocentric. We need an organization, north, south, east, west, rich, poor. India has to be part of it. Mexico, which uh, has to be part of it, has to be rules for staying in this club. Um, uh, it can, it can be, it would begin as an informal thing. It could build on the current caucus of democracies, a community of democracies in the United Nations, which right now is a formal entity that does nothing. Um, but the Republican Party begins as a caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus. This organization, we, that has soul power. That has moral legitimacy. What other democracies think. And wise presidents and wise peoples do not lightly disregard that considered opinion of mankind. And so the problem is um, that the current multilateral organizations have many of the problems of the Articles of Confederation and m big legitimacy gaps, but we can't go it alone even in today's world any more than we could for the last two centuries. So we need to develop, could begin informally, um, a new organization, a community of democracies that will have standards, actually, so China does not get to be in the club. It needs to be, though, the club that everyone wants to join. Um, and, and what's in it for the rest of the world? They can actually criticize America, actually, and, have, and get on a soapbox and say, you have the death penalty for 15-year-olds or 17-year-olds, or you have this, you, have, you, know, you don't actually have good voting technology. So this is, will be a chance for them to say, live up to the standards of this, and in turn, we will actually, it will, be, it will create an incentive for us in America to actually pay attention to um, what, what the, our fellow democracies actually think. And even if this doesn't bind us, it, we ignore this at our peril. That's, in a nutshell, what I think America's constitutional experience has to say to us. Thank you. The, the format was that the panelists then, uh, after each one has made their presentation, could, could uh, uh, comment on some of the things the others said. So why don't we start from the beginning uh, with John? Thanks. Um, Akil, that really brought back memories of being in class. <laughs> 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 Somehow you got the last word in and it spoke a little bit longer than everybody else. <laughs> Now I get to be a law professor. I can talk for as long as I want to. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I just teasing. Um, I guess the, I guess one thing about uh, what Akil had to say, which I very much agree with, is that um, I think one thing to be clear about is many things he said and some of the things Kathy said about it's good for the country to obey international law to take uh, a concerted opinion of what other countries think. That's all fine. I, I just don't think that's legally compelling. Right? That is a policy choice that we have to make, and as a country, we have to balance that against other costs and benefits of at times violating international law or reading international law differently than our um, alleged allies do. 
Um, for, and I think the war on terrorism is a good example of that because in the war on terrorism, for example, um, I think it's an open question whether, for example, members of Al-Qaeda are covered by the Geneva Convention. You know, other countries in the world may think one thing. Most of the other countries, our allies, think that they should be prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions, and we don't. Um, there are certain costs and benefits to the country of doing that. Um, the United States also plays a much uh, more important role in the world in supplying uh, international stability, international peace by undertaking wars that other countries don't want to, like the war in Kosovo. And those benefits have to be balanced against, say, violating the UN Charter when we attack Kosovo. But I think w w the only thing I would just stress is that that's a policy choice and that we should use our democratically accountable institutions to make those choices rather than to pretend that these policy choices are made for us by some body of law that's actually external to our constitution and political system. I, I just want to interject one comment, uh, Professor Mark. The, it, the categories are tending to blur these days. And uh, an example, let me give you an example. When a treaty is entered into, oftentimes it's filled with very broad language, almost like some of the statutes, like the Clean Air Act. And those those provisions of the treaty have to be interpreted. And what has happened in recent years, and one example comes to mind is the Montreal Protocol on ozone depletion, where Congress implemented it in legislation, but implemented the treaty and any adjustments thereto. And the adjustments are made by the 184 contracting parties. So that raises, even though it's pursuant to a treaty and even though you have implementing legislation, it raises the same kinds of constitutional questions that that uh, John and Cy and Catherine and you were, were talking about. So, so the entering into a treaty may just uh, spawn more uh, questions of this sort. Uh, Catherine? Okay, just um, to respond to, to one point. Um, you know, on the one hand, John says, um, and I don't want to misquote you, but I think you said, the circumstances we face today justify new rules. Um, on the other hand, Cy says, it's the old rules, uh, the old constitution. Uh, that shouldn't be discarded. Um, on the issue of whether customary international law is domestic law, according to the old rules, the old constitution, um, in the war on terrorism, it's such a hypothetical question because after all, customary international law has been incorporated into uh, domestic law by Congress. Um, so we can certainly address the issue of, well, what if Congress hadn't enacted the Federal Torture Statute, the War Crimes Act, uh, you know, criminal legislation forbidding torture. Um, but it is a hypothetical question, so it's just important to understand in the war on, on terrorism um, to understand it that way. But if we take the, historical, the hypothetical question seriously, which I think we should, um, in terms of the historical evidence, I mean, I'm an international law scholar, not a legal historian, but um, it seems to me the problem with historical evidence is that it's, it's like citing to foreign law. It's like, as John Roberts said, it's like picking your friends in a crowd. Um, so that there's counter evidence, of course, and uh, work that's been done by Harold Coe, another professor of ours from law school, um, Vicki Jackson, Martin Flaherty, both of whom will be talking on panels later today and who may address this point, uh, Tom Lee, who's servicing some really interesting uh, historical evidence about how uh, uh, the founders cared about their international commitments as a matter of the Constitution, not just as a kind of uh, policy um, matter. Um, uh, the other problem, I think, is just the role of precedent here. And, you know, we can look to the Nereid, the case from, you know, right after the adoption of the Constitution, uh, finding that the law of nations was binding federal law, the Paquete Habana case from the 18, early 1800s, and then more recently, the Sosa versus Alvarez Machine case from 2004, where Justice Souter very clearly adopted the majority view among scholars that customary international law is federal law. That was, that was under the, 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 the Federal Tort Claim Act, though, which says that you can sue for a tort only in violation of the law of nations, and he necessarily had to define what the law of nations was and find it rather narrowly. Uh, Sai? I'll pass. Okay. okay. Well, we'll take questions from uh, the audience now. And please, when, when you come down, just uh, give your name and, and your law school. I'm Tom Dalal from Rutgers Law School. Um, Professor Yu, you have uh, set forth the position that the committee, uh, the Convention Against Torture, 
should be inapplicable in the case of rendition. And I wonder whether any of the other panelists would like to address that argument, excuse me, and whether you'd like to defend your argument. I think it was a Notre Dame Law Review article that you wrote in 2004. Actually, in that article, I think I said it was applicable to rendition. But I wrote it two years ago, so I'm not sure I remember what I said. But I think actually I said even with transfers of prisoners or rendition, the prohibition on torture applies, I think. Really? It was in a footnote. Well, whatever I said, I'm sure there was support for it. Can I just address very quickly the extraterritoriality point? I mean, you know, again, Congress has spoken to this issue with regard to torture, the prohibition applying extraterritorially. But also, more recently, of course, with the leadership of John McCain, Congress has also spoken about this with regard to cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment, that that should apply extraterritorially as well in places like Guantanamo, et cetera. Yes, sir. I'm going to try and phrase this as much. Give your name in law school. I'm sorry. Christopher Allen from the George Washington Law School. I'm going to try and phrase this as much as a legal question and avoid policy, but in this topic it's kind of hard, so I apologize. Professor, you pointed out that the executives have violated or at least bent international law in cases like the Balkan Wars, the Nicaragua cases, and dropping the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. The war on terror, though, is longer in duration than these things. It's wider in the scope. It's wider in its ramifications, arguably, than these individual instances in history. And the argument is that under the UN Charter, under Geneva III, these things that we are a party to through the treaty system and the ratification of Congress might or might not allow us to do that. Now, because of the scope of the war on terror, are we changing the scope of our treaty obligations? And if we are, are we changing the scope of the obligations of the other signatories? Is that legal under any kind of international regime or any policy regime? And is it, moreover, is it legitimate? That's a good question. I don't know whether I would describe it as, or I did describe it as, the United States expanding the scope of our treaty obligations. I actually think, you know, I think both sides would agree what the United States has done is actually read the Geneva Conventions so as not to apply to the war on terrorism. So it doesn't have the, I think it would be an interesting question if the United States, for example, had read treaties broadly to cover the war on terrorism that our treaty partners did not think applied. But instead, I think. There was a certain judge that read the Geneva Convention that way, too. In case you all don't know, I just say Judge Randolph is one of those few judges who's had the pleasure of having one of his opinions on the application of the Geneva Conventions overruled by the Supreme Court and then having the Supreme Court overruled by Congress. Right. Which is why he's so knowledgeable on these issues. No comment. Well, I've had the pleasure of watching that happen, if you haven't had the pleasure of that happening. But, you know, so what I would say actually is that the Geneva Conventions have been read by the administration not to expand the scope of obligations under the treaty. In fact, you know, what I would say is that the administration has said that, and I certainly agree with this, having been in the administration at the time, the Geneva Conventions were not written to cover the war on terrorism at all. That, you know, the Geneva Conventions had been written with the idea of, you know, large, you know, large mechanized armies in the kind we saw in World War II. And that this notion of fighting a war against a non-state that operated as a network was not really in their contemplation. And this, I don't think this is just sort of mere hypothesizing. A lot of countries, I think, in the 70s saw that there was a gap in the Geneva Conventions and so signed something called additional protocols, which Jeremy Rabkin mentioned yesterday, to the Geneva Convention. It's interesting, the United States specifically refused to ratify that treaty. And when it did so, President Reagan went to the trouble issuing a message saying, we don't want to apply, we don't want to give terrorists the protections that would apply to people who follow the laws of war and are honorable warriors under the, you know, within the Geneva Convention framework. So I actually think it's actually the reverse of what you suggested in starting out. My name is Jack Grimes. I am actually a guest of a Columbia Law student. 
This question is, is directed to all the panelists, but particularly to Professor Yu and, and Powell. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of the McCain Amendment uh, banning uh, cruel, inhumane, and, and degrading treatment, and what, what uh, a practical effect uh, will that have on the war on terror? And, and uh, more generally, if the United States were to uh, have a national conversation and seek legislation to address torture, what is the most clear language that you would like to see uh, in, such a, in such a legislation to avoid the, the problems of ambiguity uh, that, uh, that, that plague the torture question? Well, in a, in a sense, I think the McCain Amendment is, it's a bit redundant in the sense that um, applying the, the, the prohibition extraterritorially is already clear from our international obligations. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has no territorial limitation. It applies to acts that states take within their own territory and acts they take uh, within their jurisdiction. Um, so in other words, when Iraq uh, invaded Kuwait, they couldn't torture or uh, violate, otherwise violate human rights against Kuwaitis. Um, so uh, the Human Rights Committee found. Um, so in a sense, I think McCain was just trying to close uh, a loophole that had been exploited by the federal torture statute in applying, making clear that torture applies extraterritorially, McCain felt, well, we also have to make clear that cruel and humane degrading treatment applies extraterritorially, even though it already does, but we just need to clarify that. Well, I, I guess I approach it a little differently. Um, I would say before uh, the McCain Amendment, um, we had signed a treaty that prohibited torture, um, did not really go to great lengths to define it, what that phrase meant, and also said states would undertake not to engage in cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. And when Congress implemented the treaty, it made the commission of torture a federal crime and did not make cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment a federal crime. And so I think what the McCain Amendment was to say, you know, Congress is now implementing that part um, of the treaty. So. Uh, I think there are um, interesting questions about whether, you know, what would happen if there was a direct conflict between that statute and the commander-in-chief question if the president, for example, um, believed uh, that we had captured, uh, you know, the press has reported that we have captured, you know, the number three, four, and five leaders of um, al-Qaeda, right, people who are in charge of actually planning terrorist attacks. And so I think the question would be, what, you know, should, is, the, is the president bound by the cruel and humane degrading treatment prohibition if he honestly believes that these people have information about an imminent attack on the United States. And it's an odd thing, even McCain said during the passage of the amendment, he said, well, you know, I, I, I want the president to do what's necessary, but then he just said, that's eh, a one in a million shot uh, that that would ever happen. And I, I'm afraid it's not anymore. I wish they were just one in a million type cases, but I don't think they are anymore in the war terrorism. But I think that's, an, I think that's a difficult question. I think you know, my personal take on it would be that Congress has the power to, um, you know, pass rules for the discipline and regulation of the armed forces. So I think the McCain Amendment is essentially makes it legal for any officer to refuse to obey any order by a superior officer or the president to engage in cruel and humane and degrading treatment, but it doesn't solve the constitutional question of what would happen if there were actually a threat of an imminent attack on the United States which you know, the president as commander in chief and chief executive has a responsibility to protect the country from. Um, one quick note, I'm far from being expert on, on the McCain legislation, but to the extent uh, any act of Congress makes something uh, a federal crime uh, in implementing an earlier treaty, it's a reminder to you all that there are certain things, I'm just going to assert it, but it's actually in the restatement of foreign relations that Professor Hinken wrote, and it's, it's just standard um, a doctrine. Uh, so I don't think actually I'm uh, in great peril of being uh, contradicted by the judges here. Um, it is simply the case that treaties, even when signed by the president and then confirmed by the Senate and then ratified internationally, cannot create a federal crime. Only a, a law, a statute, which involves the House of Representatives can do that. And that's an important recognition that there's not, in some deep sense, interchangeability as a matter of American domestic constitutional law. Uh, we might ratify a treaty saying certain things should be crimes, um, but only, if only God can make a treaty, only Congress can make a federal crime. And it's an important point about 
the House of Representatives and democracy, um, want that extra bit of the Senate, the difference between majority and two thirds, so one sixth of the Senate plus some foreign treaty partner who might be the Emir of Kuwait or some quite undemocratic potentate cannot substitute for the House of Representatives. And what, while that is true, everyone acknowledges for um, creating a federal crime, the question is what else is that true for? Is it true about um, uh, declaring war, uh, raising an army, um, spending um, a dime, uh, 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 raising a domestic tax, and maybe even repealing a federal statute. But there are certain things that treaties cannot do constitutionally. Mark Western, the University of North Dakota. Uh, professor, uh, you, I wish to inquire regarding Al Qaeda as not being a party to the Geneva Convention, uh, members of Al Qaeda uh, still are citizens of uh, nations or nation states that had ratified the Geneva Convention. Is there not then an inconsistency in the sense that the United States would be obliged to uh, give the members of Al Qaeda the protections of the Geneva Convention in that respect? Um, I guess I should have given my talk on the Geneva Conventions this morning, um, based on the interest level. I think, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, we, we were, not at, we're not at war with all those other countries. Right? The Geneva Conventions would apply if we were at war with Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Pakistan and our other, um, I guess we call them allies in the war on terrorism. Uh, but we're not, right? So uh, they are citizens of other countries, surely, but, and, and they are uh, fighting against us, but we're not at war with those signatories of the Geneva Conventions. I do think that if we are, obviously the Geneva Conventions apply so that in Iraq, you know, which is a signatory to the Geneva Conventions, those provisions apply in all Iraqi prisoners captured or prisoners of war. But I don't think that, say, you know, Saudi Arabian citizens, and there are a number of them who carried out the 9-11 attacks, are entitled to the Geneva Conventions because Saudi Arabia signed them because we're just not at war with Saudi Arabia uh, right now. Is there, is there another uh, problem? And in, in, as I recall, the Geneva Convention requires that the combatants wear sig uh, insignia and, and, and specify themselves to separate themselves out from the civilian community so that the, so that the other side does not kill uh, innocent civilians. And, and Al Qaeda does not fight that way. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. There's actually another provision in the Geneva Convention which says even if you haven't signed it, you can at the start of a conflict say you will obey it. And if you do, then you actually, the United States would have a legal obligation to follow it. And everything we know about al-Qaeda is that they don't follow the substantive provisions of the Geneva Conventions, as Judge Randolph said. And the, the policy behind those rules is that um, people who are combatants have to clearly distinguish themselves from civilians so that you don't invite attacks on civilians. And the more important principle is you do not deliberately attack civilians. You should only attack combatant targets. And you look at what al-Qaeda's very purpose is and its very method of operating, and they violate both of those two core notions of what the laws of war are about. So I think you know, there's an important policy question there. I, I, there's no, I'm, not, I'm just saying it's not legally required. Certainly President Bush or President Gore could have said, um, even though I'm not legally required to follow Geneva Conventions, I can still do so if I want, provide those protections to people capturing the war on terrorism, but that's a policy choice that's got to be not, it's not legally compelled. Just a very quick follow-up is that um, that point addresses um, Geneva Convention 3 in terms of prisoner of war protection, but there's still Geneva Convention 4, which applies to civilians. So even if, uh, you know, we can say that the Al-Qaeda, because they don't have distinctive insignia, et cetera, uh, they don't meet the criteria in Geneva 3, there's, there's still the argument that they're covered by Geneva 4, not to mention the whole array of human rights treaties. Uh, Howard Giske, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, we just had the uh, UN Human Rights uh, Commission declare uh, Guantanamo Bay uh, uh, illegal and violation and for its closing. Uh, and then this was used as uh, the precedent for certain infamous crimes at uh, Abu Ghraib uh, after certain uh, uh, infamous uh, memos of torture by Mr. Yu. So uh, do you agree, or do, actually do you reject uh, Judge Jackson's uh, position on uh, the existence of war crimes at Nuremberg, or do you adopt uh, Carl Schmitt's position after the Reichstag fire that the Fuhrer principle applies, which uh, translated into English 
That's the unitary executive. Well, uh, it had been uh, renamed the binary executive after the shooter-in-chief uh, threatened the executive. But that was another uh, uh, problem in this thing. So um, do you uh, members of the panel think that certain of you could be uh, subjected to a future Nuremberg uh, Tribunal? Or in the case of people visiting Italy, there's also the president of uh, General Pinochet uh, having his beautiful trip to London rudely interrupted for uh, several months. I'm going to have to get out my secret decoder ring to figure out the question. Uh, but, um, but, you know, um, uh, you know, I guess one thing I'd say is, uh, you know, I, the fact that the, I think the fact that uh, various bodies of the UN are criticizing the Guantanamo Bay facility is a very good example of some of the issues we talked about last night, which was that um, you have these very undemocratic countries which violate human rights in far greater degree than anything the United States has done, uh, issuing judgments about uh, the conduct of the war on terrorism in Guantanamo Bay. Well, in the same island, you have massive deprivation of human rights, which you know, I don't think regularly invoke the, you know, the condemnation of the United Nations. And I think that goes to show the point I was trying to make that international you didn't do that, did you? No. <laughs> International law is often, uh, often and should be seen in, in, today as part of the foreign policies of other countries, and that other countries use international law as a species of international politics uh, one way or the other. Um, the only other thing I'll say is that the uh, unitary executive theory, um, which is often attributed to me, is actually Sai's idea, uh, <laughs> but uh, actually is Alexander Hamilton's idea. Um, he did not call it the unitary executive theory, but uh, I don't think either of us would claim any originality in, well, Sai maybe because uh, uh, Sai's a chaired professor and I'm not, um, <laughs> claim originality in the idea that the unitary executive idea comes from Alexander Hamilton um, in the debates about the debates about the neutrality proclamation. One thing I'll just add about what's been said about the neutrality proclamation is that uh, when President Washington was uh, talking to his cabinet about what to do, and they actually decided things at cabinet meetings back then. Um, he took the opinion of all the members of the cabinet, including Thomas Jefferson, about whether he could issue the neutrality proclamation and whether he had to get congressional approval to do so. And every one of them said the president has the sole authority to issue the neutrality proclamation, did not have to go to Congress and get a statute or to ask Congress how to interpret the Treaty of Alliance with France. Uh, one thought on war crimes. Uh, uh, and I think Jeremy Rabkin mentioned this, actually it may have been after uh, uh, the, the, the panel yesterday, but Americans may be particularly vulnerable here because Americans do much of the fighting um, uh, around the world. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, so, but if we were to take a formal juridical perspective on the thing, Kosovo, I think, um, and John, you mentioned this before, um, was not authorized. Um, so that would be very dangerous for former President Clinton uh, if he wants to travel around the world, if you take that formal juridical perspective. Now, what might I say about the, the difference between Kosovo and Iraq? Well, one difference is we had a lot more democratic nations um, in Kosovo than we did in, in Iraq, but, but, that's, but that isn't a formally recognized part of the, the Jeremy Waldron international uh, uh, law perspective, but I'm actually saying it should be in the future. We should actually pay more attention to what the consensus of the world democracies is, and we don't quite yet have a forum for actual real votes to be taken that, that matter, where, people, where, the, where the, the voting members actually consider very carefully which side they want to, to be on on this. Uh, I'd like to say something in defense of uh, my uh, co-author, John. There's been a, you know, uh, a two-year-long campaign to demonize him, and it's very unfortunate because the, you know, it's not really—they're not really trying to get John. You know, John's a, John's a little pawn in the, in the big scheme. They're trying to get other people to not write these opinions in the future, and I, I hope people that you know take up these jobs in the future don't get the sense that they have to trim their sails in order to avoid being criticized. There's a legitimate question about the extent to which Congress can regulate presidential power, and John has a particular view and other people have other views, but it's not as if John's position is ridiculous or outrageous. 
You just, you, just have to flip, you just have to flip around the question. If Congress authorized terrorism and required it, and John took the view that the President didn't have to follow the statute as Commander in Chief, would you have a role reversal by people who are, are you know, declaiming the President's decisions? And I think you would. And what's really driving it is torture, not any particular view of the Constitution. And you know, I think John's view would be the same, regardless of whether Congress passed a statute uh, authorizing torture or forbidding it. So I think he's being consistent, and I, I actually doubt whether people who are criticizing him really have a soft place in their heart for Congress as opposed to the President if we actually had a different set of, a different statutory scheme altogether. Anyway, I just wanted to come to my friend. Thank you. So my name is Josh Kleinfeld, and I'm from Yale Law School, also a professor of law student. And the panel is very encouraging about my prospects. So. <laughs> In fact, I used to think it was necessary to be a professor of law student. Now I'm thinking it might be sufficient to be a professor of law student. Um, my question is, I don't want to jump on the bandwagon. My question is more directed to John Yu, though it's for the, the whole panel. Uh, you know, I, I guess this uh, question starts when I was digging around in the archives that, that were archives uh, concerning Dean Acheson, Harry Truman's Secretary of State negotiations to create NATO. Uh, and I, I was struck at just the sense of details, contracting involved in creating NATO. All these rules had to be established, internal rules of operation. It was a little bit like a complicated corporate transaction. And uh, it, it struck me that if we couldn't inspire confidence that we would follow our own declarations of intent, our own rules, we wouldn't have been able or wouldn't have been able to securely enter into that military alliance. So my question is proceeding, I suppose most of these questions proceed from sort of humanitarian or human rights considerations. I'm, I'm concerned that if we if we are known as, as a country that doesn't believe international law binds, or our own treaties bind, I should say. I don't want to speak to customary international law, but if we don't believe our own treaties bind, it will hamper our ability to enter into military alliances. And that's why I just want to suggest that there are two options when we do enter into treaty alliances. Uh, one is to withdraw if we want to do something contrary to them, and another is to make a good legal argument the way we did with preemption and self-defense regarding Article 51 of the UN Charter. But not to just say we're well, unbound. I think that might hurt us with respect to our allies. Well, I, th I think that's a good question. Because um, I, I, I don't want to be read as saying that the United St that treaties have no value uh, and that the United States should just uh, feel free to, you know, it shouldn't feel itself in some sense bound by treaties. Uh, the point I wanted to make was that we're not, I don't think that um, I do think that whether we continue to obey treaties or not is a political decision and that the United States can, as you said, withdraw from treaties that don't make any sense. I certainly uh, think that we also have to acknowledge that the United States should pull out of treaties that don't make sense for us anymore either, like the ABM Treaty under President Bush or the Treaty Alliance with France that we've been talking about, which um, we pulled out of uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, I think what your point is, is there some kind of, and I think this is a, a better version of the argument Jeremy Waldron was making, because he was making kind of an ethical argument that we have to follow all international law because it's law. And what I read you as saying is there's a, a, an instrumental reason for obeying, uh, or at least following treaty commitments obeying international law because it, it enhances our reputation for cooperation, and so it'll be easier to um, get other countries to cooperate with us in the future. And I, I don't deny that. I just think that that is a question that we ought to leave in the hands of the political branches. And they, when they make these kinds of decisions, that's obviously something they should and I think something they do take into account. But on the other hand, I think you have to admit that there are other competing considerations that may outweigh it, right? So that the interest in one's reputation for cooperation is not some sort of overriding factor that is just greater in magnitude than everything else. Thank you. Craig Bruni, Catholic University of America. Um, my question is for Professor Powell. Um, if, I guess this point is debatable, but if we assume that the idea of the binding nature of customary international law arose in a time when natural law was, you know, that the, was understood as like the, as the jurisprudence, where these rights and these norms are written into the very fabric of the universe, and that governments who disobeyed them gave up the legitimacy. Now we're in a very different period where natural law has been discredited. We live in an era of positivism and social contract. Um, and we've given up a lot of those basic premises that made the binding nature of customary law that made sense. 
um, how, I guess, how can we justify today in this era of jurisprudence um, the continuing, sort of continuing to consider cu customary international law binding? Well, we're going to have to keep the questions and answers short because we're over time and I don't want to intrude on the next panel. So then you'll be the last quest questioner. Okay. Well, I guess just briefly, I would say that I think many of the same considerations that guided the founders should guide us today about the value of the law of nations and, uh, and the idea of reciprocity. That, uh, you know, yes, the president needs flexibility, and there's a benefit to that, but there's also a benefit to pre-commitment, and that benefit is reciprocity, that we would want other governments to treat us uh, the way that we should treat them and other people around the world. Hi, I'm Peter Margulies from Roger Williams Law School. It's a question for Professor Powell, but I welcome the contributions of the other panelists as well. Uh, Catherine, you said that uh, Congress may have greater power uh, pursuant to treaty than would have under domestic law. I'm wondering if you think that's also true for the judicial power. For instance, you mentioned that the bombing of undefended cities might be illegal under international law. Uh, suppose you had a court that was required to adjudicate the question of uh, whether a city, in fact, been bombed under that circumstance and, and what remedies to apply. Uh, I take it that under domestic law, that would probably be a political question. That would be outside the scope of judicial power under Article Three. Would international law either permit or require a court to reach a different result? It's a great question, and I think in some ways it relates back to the point Akil made about the fact that um, there are some ways in which constitutionally our system um, might require um, uh, an understanding of whether it's Congress's role to adopt a crime, like in the context of torture, or an understanding of courts not being able to enforce international law, say, because of political question. And I think one of the things about international law uh, and treaties is that they leave open to governments the flexibility to incorporate these standards in ways that are consistent with their system. Um, so they call on states to incorporate the treaties and for courts to uh, provide remedies. But it really leaves open quite a great deal of flexibility uh, to governments to do that. I have actually a question. I'm going to bite the bullet and ask about customary Please international Please give your law. name and law. Oh, yes. Um, Nishat Hassan, University of Pittsburgh. Um, and I guess I'm going to begin by referring to um, okay. Professor Amar's comments about uh, rescinding the Articles of Confederation and how we got to the Constitution. And my question is, if in the, in the small sphere in which we have accepted or choose to accept customary international law, and we are in a situation in which our partner has rescinded it, where do we draw on as lawyers, as judiciary, as a body of law in retaliation and to rescind from that? Where are we drawing on for how far we can go and what we can do? Um, well, uh, if uh, by transitivity, if treaties are clearly higher than customary international law, which most people have conceded, or at least they're no lower, and if even in the case of a treaty, uh, breach by other parties would justify rescission, I would think it follows, as the lawyers say, a fortiori, that that would be true of customary international law as well. As a matter of just sort of self-help and contract and reciprocity and fairness and common sense. David Matthews, University of Notre Dame. I have a question for, for, for Professor Amar, and it actually does start with where. Where in your hierarchy of the Constitution, statutes, treaties, state law, do Supreme Court decisions interpreting the law fit? And if you would perhaps comment on that in light of ex parte querin and its distinction between lawful and unlawful combatants in war and how they're supposed to be treated. Um, very briefly, um, and the more elaboration of this actually is in uh, the, the book, copies of which are here. <laughs> and you can pick them up right after this um, uh, panel. Uh, uh, one of the great things about America is we believe in free markets. Uh, and, 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 my, and my publisher reminded me of this when I visited uh, them yesterday here in the, the great world city of New York. Um, 
The, ju the judicial article is third out of three. Um, and uh, that's partly uh, because judges actually were not leaders of the American Revolution. Most of them actually, ten, in 10 of the 13 states, they sided with uh, uh, George III against uh, George Washington. Um, uh, you all were taught about judicial review, of course, in um, your first day, many of you of law school, Marbury versus Madison, what you may not have been taught is in the entire period before 1850, there's only one time that the Supreme Court invalidates an act of Congress on constitutional grounds. It's Marbury versus Madison. It's one sentence of one section of a very large statute dealing with the judiciary. And even then, what John Marshall does is tell Congress it can't do what Congress actually didn't even try to do in the statute. So Congress isn't particularly offended that they can't do this thing that they never tried to do. Um, in that same period, presidents are actually vetoing bills on constitutional grounds over and over and over again, about uh, two dozen constitutional vetoes as against one exercise of judicial review. The president is actually made independent of the legislature, more independent than are the judges, because his salary can't be increased or decreased. I know I'm sounding a little unitary executive-ish here, um, but so be it. Um, I've learned actually from several members of this panel and, and from Alexander Hamilton, and, and George Washington actually did believe in a unitary executive. He thought he was it. Um, uh, so, um, uh, um, no, Marbury versus Madison doesn't proclaim the Supreme Court the ultimate interpreter of the Constitution. That phrase doesn't appear in United States reports until after um, uh, World War II. Uh, and or, or the mid, sec, uh, second uh, mid 20th century, so um, it's not in the supremacy clause quite for a reason because the Supreme Court didn't really claim, and most people didn't really think in the American constitutional tradition that there was an equation between what the Supreme Court said and what the supreme law of the land is. They thought that this document that ordinary farmers had voted on, um, that's here in my pocket that I'm searching for. I almost pulled out pictures of my kids, but uh, um, they thought this was the supreme law of the land because we the people had or, or ratified it. And all three branches had oaths of office. Um, and that the one actually branch that had some special um, uh, responsibilities, special oath above and beyond the Article 6 oath, was the President of the United States who has to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So um, all branches um, have responsibilities under it, not just the courts. And the courts were third out of three. And, and no president has ever taken the oath exactly as it's written. They added the words, so help me God, which um, uh, are borrowed from England and about half the state constitutions. But um, this one is open to people of all faiths and no faith. And two of the four guys up there on Mount Rushmore were not members of any formal church, but they could add as a matter of personal religious choice, so help me God, as Washington did at the beginning and, and his successors have done. point about um, customary international law that Professor Powell raised, I'd like to specifically address you and uh, Prakash. Um, just the question, was Paquette de Habana wrongly decided? <clears throat> um, well, the interesting thing about Paquette de Habana is it says that if you have a contrary legislative statute or executive act, the customary international law doesn't apply. And the people who talk about these court cases as if they just adopted customary international law in toto without any override by Congress or the President, tend to try to minimize that. So even on its own terms, that case suggests that the President and Congress can supersede customary international law if they choose to do so. How they do that, it, you know, it doesn't actually spell that out, but they, they could certainly do that. Um, there, you know, there's, there's just a question about whether the courts are different, different creatures than the President and Congress in the sense that courts are applying other laws all the time. Right, Hamilton in the Federalist Papers says that the laws of Japan can be applied in the federal courts. Uh, I don't think the executive branch has any duties with respect to the laws of Japan, and I don't think they have any duties with respect to the customary international law until such time as Congress actually incorporates it into a statute. So you might actually think that there's, some, there's, a, bit, there's a better basis for customary international law being used as a, as a, as a law in the courts and not have that apply to the president when he takes care that the laws be faithfully executed, and not have that as actually a restriction on what types of laws Congress could pass. So there's, there's a way of trying to reconcile what the courts did. But, you know, those cases were written in an era where we, we, you know, the courts thought that, you know, the common law was our law, and we've abandoned that notion, and we just haven't done so quite yet with respect to customary international law, and whether we do that, you know, depends on what this court says. 
Thank you. Great panel. Thank you very much.